take your Bibles out, please, and open them up to Galatians chapter 5. This is a continuation of our brief study of the Holy Spirit, just using Jesus' comments in John as just sort of a springboard to look at the person and work of the Holy Spirit. So Galatians chapter 5 this morning, and as you turn there, uh, I uh, kind of a blast from the past, but I, I read recently about a Christian man who, who drove up behind a car, and this is back when Christian bumper stickers first became a thing, became popular, and the bumper sticker on the car in front of him at the red light, it, it said, honk if you love Jesus. Anybody remember that one? You know, honk if you love Jesus. And the guy had never seen a sign like that before, but he thought it was kind of a cute idea, so he just kind of blew his horn. He thought, like, well, that's pretty cool. They just honked his horn, and he just kind of expected the driver in front of him to, I don't know, maybe wave or give him the one-way sign. You know, this is back in the day. Well, instead, the dude rolled down the window, turned around and shot a black Shouted back, you know, shouted back at him, stop blowing your blankety blank horn. Can't you see I'm at a red light? You know, he's like, well, you know. I, I think that's funny because I think we all recognize that if somebody claims to be a Christian, then a certain standard of conduct is expected of them, right? I mean, we don't expect a Christian to be perfect, but we do expect them to show some of the fruit of Christian character. Well, Paul wrote of this fruit. Right here in his letter to the Galatians, chapter 5, verse 20, 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. So we are right to expect this fruit to be present in Christians because well, one of the goals of the Holy Spirit of God is to reproduce the character traits of Jesus Christ within us. And that's what I touched on during our first study of the Holy Spirit. We learned two Sundays ago that the Holy Spirit glorifies Jesus Christ by reproducing his character within us. Well, it is that very same subject that is related to our study of the Spirit today because if we are filled with the Holy Spirit, we looked at that last Sunday, then the fruit of the Spirit, it, it will abound in our lives. So let's just look this morning at the fruit of the Holy Spirit as well as the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Probably the most important thing that can be said about the fruit of the Spirit is this. It is one fruit and it is to be present in its entirety within every Christian. And this is why the word is singular. Did you notice that's fruit instead of plural fruits? This, this is not true of the gifts of the Spirit. We're going to come to those in just a little bit. Gifts are given to one or another Christian by the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit wills to do that. Therefore, somebody, you know, one person might be a teacher, another person might be a pastor, still another, an evangelist, and, and so on. Different gifts, no one possesses all of the gifts of the Spirit. We'll come to that in a minute. But by contrast right here, each and every single Christian is to possess all of the Spirit's fruit. And the reason for this is just the nature of the fruit itself. And what, what I mean is, if, if we ask, well, what is the fruit? Well, really the simplest and fullest answer is the fruit is the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life, in my life. So if Jesus Christ is present in your life, his character will begin to show itself in all of its fullness. The fruit, it will be in your life. So let me just quickly just run through the different manifestations of the Spirit's fruit. Love leads the list. How could it not? Because according to 1 John 4, 8, God is love, right? And the greatest of all Christian virtues, according to 1 Corinthians 13, is love, right? You know, when, when, when God sent Christ to die for our sins, what was it that sent Christ? It, it was God's love. What sent the Holy Spirit to live within us? We just read it in John 14. It, it was God's love. And so it just naturally follows that we, if we name the name of Christ, will show love to each other. In fact, Jesus said that is precisely how the rest of the world will even Notice that we're different. There's something different about you Christians. What is it? Well, he said in John 13, By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So let's be honest. 
Is it difficult to love people? Well, it's interesting. You know, the Bible says it's very easy to love people who already love us. The Bible says it's, it's very easy to love people who are just like us. I mean, what's hard about that? In fact, the whole modern church growth movement was really built on, on this easy attraction of building a church full of people just like us. Probably the most prominent church growth guru wrote the Bible on church growth a few years ago. He held out his own church as the perfect example. Like, do it like we have and you'll be huge and prosperous and honor the Lord. It's interesting, uh, and this is just right in his book, he hired two professional models for a little internal advertising campaign that went on in his church. And, and so the young man model and young woman model, they just perfectly fit the mold, literally just how they looked, of, of who the pastor wanted to build his church around. And these mock church members, because remember, they're not members there. They're just, you know, right out of Hollywood, really. And it's interesting, you look at them. Uh, they look like Ken and Barbie. They, they really do. And the pastor gave them cute little names. Like, if we would have done it, it would have been like, Winnetka Will and Winnetka Wendy. You know, just isn't that cute? Isn't that clever? And, and he just said, these are the people, church, that we are trying to reach. And here's what's interesting. And that's why his book became a bestseller and everybody tried to copy it. It worked. Because Will and Wendy, well, they were who the church people already were. Right? Young, good-looking, educated, upwardly mobile white people. That's who the church already was. Oh, and that's who we're going to go get. And so their church just became a homogenous group of people who just easily loved each other because they were each other. Right? They wore the same clothes. They ate at the same restaurants. They cheered on their kids at the same Little League games, vacationed at the same places. Well, here's what we know. The real kingdom of God isn't like that at all. It's not real. God saves real people, not syrupy copies of one another. And real people come in all shapes and varieties and ethnicities and backgrounds and on and on and on. And yet here's where it gets hard. It's hard to love real people. Real people who are different than you. And different than me. That's where it gets hard. And let's just be honest too. We can't pull it off on our own. And that's why the world is constantly divided. Ah, but with Holy Spirit help, with the Holy Spirit dwelling in you and in me, growing Christ's character of love within us, then wow, we can actually begin to transform and change and actually come to love brothers and sisters in the kingdom, in the family, who are very different from us. And that, according to Jesus, is what catches the world's attention. That's when the world is says, look at something different there. Look at how much they love each other. That's what will catch the world's attention. So joy. Joy is the next fruit. Joy really corresponds to happiness. Uh, and on the surface, they're related. But happiness is different because happiness, as, as you've noticed, happiness is dependent on the circumstances. But if you remove the fortunate circumstances from anybody's life, well, the happiness just gets removed too. Joy, though, is never dependent on circumstances. And that just means a Christian can be joyful even in the midst of suffering, even great suffering. I remember the disciples who rejoiced when they were in a dark dungeon thrown there after being beaten for why? For preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I mean, how in the world? And let's, that's an extreme example. What, what it usually means is that, that you will be joyful even when you don't feel very good. You'll be joyful when, when your kids are going crazy. You'll be joyful when money's tight and then your car breaks down. You'll be joyful even when your marriage is in a slump. You get the point. Now, I'm not saying you will be happy in those circumstances because that would be fake. I'm saying that the Holy Spirit will help you by giving you a perspective on things that's tied to eternity. And you can literally know the joy of the Lord even there. Peace. Peace is the next manifestation of the Spirit's fruit. Peace naturally follows joy. And you think about peace. Peace, where does it come from? According to the Bible, peace is literally God's gift to us as humanity because he's the one that brokered this peace. He did it himself at the cross of Christ. And what I'm getting at, before the cross, all of us naturally... We're at enmity with God. You need to know that we natural born sinners, were never, we were never neutral toward God. We were never for God. We are at, only at odds with God. 
Uh, and why are we at odds, by the way, with God? Well, he holds the job we want. We, I want his job. Don't you like to be in charge of your own self? You know, I want to be in charge of me and, and you and everything. Yeah, I mean, oh, but God already has that job, so we, we don't like him. We don't like him telling us what to do. But if you repented of your rebellion against God, you, you're literally now at peace with him because he made that peace with you. So with that background, here's what we're learning right here. We as saved Christians, we are supposed to show the effects of that peace. That peace that God brokered with you is supposed to spill over in just all the circumstances of your life. It's what we might call just a peace of mind, according to Philippians 4. So, peace should reign in our homes, 1 Corinthians 7. Peace should reign between Christians of different, different ethnic backgrounds, Ephesians chapter 2. Peace should reign in our churches, Ephesians 4, Colossians 3. Peace should reign in our relationships with, with all people, all men and women, Hebrews 12. And these things and more, they just remind us we're to be known as what? Peacemakers. And that, that's what we're to be known as, we Christians, peacemakers. Quarreling, argumentative spirits, those kind of people, that kind of attitude, that, that should never characterize Christian people quarreling, demand my own way, you know, full of angst and divisiveness. I'm going to get you before you get me. I'm going to win. That should never characterize Christian people. Loud, pushy, demand their own way people do not characterize spirit-filled followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Next, patience. Patience is the virtue of putting up with other people, right? Even when they try our patience. Patience is interesting. It, patience is often used of God in the Bible. Why? Because he shows incredible patience in putting up with people like you and people like me who are rebellious against him. And you think about it, the, the lack of this fruit in the world, the lack of, of patience in the world, really it helps explain what we're seeing today. We are literally seeing a sharp uptick in America of just anger, angst, rage, we just see this in the modern world. People are not at peace for a variety of very crucial spiritual reasons. And people today are being told that you're free to freely express yourself. You need to do it. That's being authentic, they say. So what does that all mean? Well, we got a whole lot of shouting going on. We, we have a whole lot of bad acting going on and all the divisiveness that follows. I mean, you can literally, today, you can almost see it like it's the color blue or something. People aren't at peace enter the followers of Jesus Christ into that it's my goodness it's like by God's it's like he knows what he's doing by God's design we are actually the ones who bring peace to the world it's, we're the peacemakers so in a world where unbelievers rage and rebel against their maker and against everybody else we are the ones who come in and act as preservatives of the peace. Literally, without us in the world, the world would be at its own throat. Look what will happen to the world at the very end of time. It will be at its, we're the preservatives. It's like God supernaturally gifted us with the Spirit's fruit of peace so that just in the course of your daily life, you just shake it out as if it's salt from a salt shaker. You just shake it out in the little world as you live your life. Kindness, next. Kindness is the attitude out of which God acts towards people. God is kind. So it makes sense that if we Christians are to be kind, well, we have to try to act with the same kindness out of which God acts towards us. Now, I would suggest a little change in words uh, in your vocabulary. Instead of referring to someone as nice, you know, we say that, oh, they're nice. Ask yourself why you say that. Why would you think that? Because being nice is not the same thing at all as being kind. They're so nice, we say, except when they're not, right? Um, nice too easily means how we treat people when we're getting our way, right? So long as you don't ruffle my feathers, man, I'm the nicest guy in the world. You know, get on my wrong side, you'll see the real me. Or nice is, you know, oh, I'm really nice while I'm manipulating you so I can get my way. I'm so nice. You see, there's an ulterior motive there. Kindness by contrast, is rooted in character. It comes from the Holy Spirit. Kindness reaches way down deep into who you are. It grows out of who you really are as a born-again Christian. Whereas niceness, 
Oh, it's just surface. So, so as you go out this week as a spirit-filled Christian, just let the Spirit's fruit of kindness guide you in how you act towards other people. Goodness. Goodness is similar to kindness, but goodness in the Bible is most often reserved for situations where the recipient does not merit the goodness. It's kind of like generosity. It's similar to love because it is easy to be good to people who merit goodness, right? You're not doing, it's not hard at all to be good to people who earn your goodness. What takes Holy Spirit help is being good to people who aren't good. Being generous to people who don't deserve, don't merit your goodness. And they're the ones who need it most, though. They're the ones who need it most. Faithfulness, next. Faithfulness is trustworthiness reliability and and the the virtue here this fruit involves truth obviously which in turn makes it part of the character of God so the person who is faithful he or she will do what they said they'll do and then they won't quit doing it when the going gets tough faithful next gentleness gentleness is the virtue of the person who is always in control of themselves so much in control of themselves they're always angry at the right time. Think about that. As against sin. There is a time to be angry. Oh, and they're never angry at the wrong time. Gentleness. I spoke this week at the funeral of the mother of one of my lifelong friends. It really hit me. My friend's mom and his dad and all five children. They are marked and distinguished by this very manifestation of the Spirit's fruit. Gentleness. Gentleness gentleness and my goodness how our world it needs more gentleness right we, our world needs more spirit-filled Christians who lean in hard to showing gentleness well the final manifestation of the Spirit's fruit is self-control self-control it is the quality that gives victory to us over our fleshly desires and it's therefore closely related to just the purity of mind and a purity of conduct. Let me quote William Barclay. It is that great quality which comes to a man when Christ is in his heart. That quality which makes him able to live and to walk in the world. And yet to keep his garments unspotted from the world. What a great comment. Well, I raced through the, feet, the fruit really quick. I wish I had a month to preach on that fruit. But I wanted to get to a major question and it's this. What makes the difference between a fruitful Christian and a non-fruitful one? Or between a Christian who produces the fruit of the Spirit and somebody who just exhibits only the works of the flesh? Well, a tremendous answer is found by the Lord Jesus in John 15. We're not quite there yet, but let me quote what Jesus said in John 15 to his disciples when he says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is. That bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. And it's interesting here, Jesus' answer has three parts. We're looking at what makes the difference between a fruit-bearing Christian and somebody who just bears all the lust of the flesh, all the works of the flesh. Jesus' answer has three parts. So first, in order to be fruitful, the branch which bears the fruit must be what? Attached to the vine. That is, it's got to be alive. It can't just be a dead piece of wood. And so in spiritual terms, this just means simply, you've got to be a Christian. You're never going to bear Holy Spirit fruit if you're not a Christian. But, so, so if you're not alive in Christ, well, back to Galatians. If you've still got your Bible open there, just look right back up earlier in Galatians 5. Paul tells us exactly what the sinful acts of nature are. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery idolatry and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. He's like, why is he looking at modern America, isn't he? That, that it is. But the fruit of the Spirit becomes possible 
when the life of Christ begins to flow through me. Second, we're looking at what explains the difference between a fruit-bearing Christian and an unfruitful one. Secondly, according to Jesus, there must be cultivation. And, and this is the point of his opening statement where he refers to God as the vine dresser or the gardener or the husbandman, depending upon which translation you have there. It just means God, it means that God cares for us. He, he exposes us to the sunshine of his presence. He enriches the soil in which he planted us. He sees to it that we are protected even through spiritual drought. So what I'm saying is if you aspire to be fruitful, well, you'll, you'll stay very close to God. Through the obvious things, through prayer, you'll feed on his word, you will keep close company with other Christians. How many times in my life as a pastor do I meet people who tell me that they're a Christian? We'll talk a little bit more. And then they'll just admit to me, but you know, I don't really go to church much, preacher. Okay, are you between church? Well, I just kind of fell out. You know, well, how, you know, well, I hadn't been in about 10 years. Well, how about the Word of God? Do you read it? You know, I don't really read the Bible much. Now, obviously, I'm not God. I can't speak to their soul. What I can certainly speak to is the condition of their soul. And they're kind of like the sower's seed that fell among the thorns or fell on the hard ground, right? They, they're not going to flourish. They can't flourish and grow. There's no cultivation of spiritual fruit because, because they're separated from the means that God uses to care for his children. Third and finally, according to Jesus, what's the difference between a fruitful Christian and a non-fruitful one? Pruning. There must be pruning. Now, pruning can be unpleasant uh, because it usually means, when it comes to God pruning you and me, it means that he is going to cut away things that we treasure we like it, we want it, we're comfortable with it, we've been doing it a long time, whatever it is, we've been loved, but it will be removed from our lives, and sometimes that means it will even involve suffering. But here's the thing, there is a purpose in the pruning, and that makes really all the difference, the purpose in it. And by the way, the purpose is to bring more fruit. William Fitch, an old writer, he wrote on this theme, he says, pruning is an art which only a great master can really employ, and God is such an artist. He knows the branches in each bush that are not bearing fruit. He cuts them down. We should be grateful for such wonderful care. He never gives up. He is determined that his children should grow in grace and that thereby they should manifest the fruit of Christian great grace in all its purity and glory. So the heavenly husbandman works with us cleanses us, prunes where necessary, and plants a crop. Do we flinch? Perhaps. But we do not lose courage when we know that there is a purpose in our pain. Isn't that something? We can go through a lot. And when you just know that there's a purpose in it, and the heavenly vine dresser is your Father who loves you, we can really go through a lot. So the fruit of the Spirit. If you are a Christian, if, if, if you are connected to the life of Jesus Christ, which just flows through the power of the Holy Spirit in you, you have all that fruit. We just went through all of it, every bit of it. So, so what do you do starting tomorrow morning? Just join the Spirit. It's God, help me. I got this fruit. I have this Holy Spirit. I have you, your Spirit in me. So just yield to Him and just say, God, I want to yield to you this week for greater cultivation. Grow it in me. But I'll tell you, God does a whole lot more than just work in us or we become inward turned. God also surrounds us with external helps in the form of different Christian ministries. And this brings us to our second and final topic this morning. And it is just the gifts of the Holy Spirit. The gifts. And, and for the sake of time, and this is really wonderful, there's really only three major New Testament passages where these gifts are discussed. You can see it there, Romans 12. 1 Corinthians 12. Now, the gift of tongues is discussed more fully in chapter 14. I will address that more fully next week. And God willing, we'll all break out in tongues and have a great time. No, I don't know, maybe. But we're going to reserve that one for next week. And then Ephesians chapter 4. So the first thing that we notice, if we just took the time and read through those, those are the three passages right there, the gifts of the Spirit. And as we would read through those, uh, here's the first thing we notice. The gifts mentioned vary from passage to passage. For example, only two of the gifts of the Spirit occur in all three chapters. And they are this, the gift of prophecy 
which means it's preaching, it's what I'm doing right now in this modern age, and the gift of teaching, teaching and preaching. Obviously, those were important to the mind of Paul, to the ongoing life of the church. But aside from those two, the gifts, and, and there's at least 20 of them if you count them all up, they are radically different from list to list. In other words, the emphasis of those three chapters is not upon a certain list or gifts that are always to be present in every single church at any period of its history in any given location on planet earth. That's not it. No, the emphasis is on the fact that the Holy Spirit, he will give whatever gifts that, that the church needs at that moment in time. He knows. He knows what he's doing. Now some gifts, they're going to be present in every single church. Things like teaching, preaching, faith, wisdom, helping, serving, because those gifts literally are, are the part and parcel. They are the nature of what it means to be a New Testament church. There's a second class of gifts that we'll come to, if we had more time that you would read through, and, and like, like the gift of apostleship. Well, they've just ceased. I mean, the apostles died. There's only 12 of them, and they died 2,000 years ago. Still others, like the gifts of healing or the gift of tongues. They might be present. They might not be present, Okay. Here's what I'm saying. Uh, the list, that's not the important thing. The point that God is teaching us when it comes to the gifts is we can be sure that the Holy Spirit is going to give exactly the gifts that the church needs right at that moment. He knows what it means. Yeah, have you ever seen that show Alone on TV? That's a great show, Heather and I like that show. Ten contestants, they drop them off out in the middle of the wilderness alone. And the last man or woman standing gets 500,000. I've looked at what they, they starved themselves. I'm like, half a million? That's not enough. You better crank it up to a couple of million before I'm going to get it. Anyway, $500,000, there's always some people interested in doing it. And basically the only rule is this. Each contestant gets to bring 10 items of their choosing into the wilderness. And it's interesting to me as I watch that, I wonder, what did they bring? You know, what did they choose? Because you better choose wisely because that's all you get. No matter what you face out there, that's all you got is 10. And I thought about that. Praise Jesus that that's not how he set up the church. You know, I love that. In other words, he didn't say, choose 10. You got 10. And listen, you better choose wisely because that's all I'm giving you. That's it. These 10. No, no the, the Holy Spirit is present in every single church. He is a, he's observing who's there. He knows who's his, who isn't his. He knows who's real, who's fake. He knows who he saved. All, he knows what is needed. And so he gives the gifts that are needed right then. Well, the second thing we notice as we read through these chapters about the gifts of the Spirit. So it's, it's not all people having the same gift. Nevertheless, each believer has at least one. At least one. And he's read through those chapters and you just see it. For example, Paul writes to all the believers at the church in Rome saying in Romans 12, Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them, if prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, and, and so on. And the implication here is that, is that we each have a gift and we use it. You have a gift, you use it. Similarly, in, in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 12, 7, to each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Again, verse 11. All these are empowered, so all these Christians in the church are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Wow, this truth has great importance because it in introduces us to the concept of just personal responsibility. Personal responsibility. If the gifts of the Spirit, Spirit weren't given to every single Christian, then I think we could just kind of take our ease. Right? If they weren't given to all of us, I mean, it'd be too easy just to kick back and just say, well, I've taken a personal inventory and I don't have any of them, so I really don't have to do anything. You know, I, I, he didn't give me anything, you know, so I'm just going to kick back, kick my feet up, just let you guys do it all. No, God gave each of us a gift, so we obviously are needed. If he gave everybody a gift, you're needed. And that just means that the work that God intends to be done, it is always going to suffer if you neglect to use what he entrusted to you. 
So my friend I mentioned whose mother died, he told me that the pastor at his mother's church told him that, that he wasn't sure if the church could literally pull off feeding the family. You know, kind of the traditional, we're going to feed you lunch before the funeral. Why is that? I mean, aren't helping and serving spiritual gifts, aren't they? I mean, aren't there people in the church there who can help and serve? I mean, didn't my friend's mother for years serve on the committee that helped and served people in that exact same capacity? Yeah, in fact, they found his mom's spiral notebook, and she, lit, she was an accountant, so she had it lit. She said, if there's 200 people, here's exactly the number of chickens I need to buy. I mean, she had it just broken down like that, you know. Well, how, what's going on? Well, yes, I mean, but here's the thing, at that church, the wonderful ladies at that church who have embraced those roles of serving and helping for decades, well, guess what their ages are now? They're rather elderly. I mean, I, I know them. I said hi to them in the kitchen, you know. They're getting to the point where it's harder to get up and get over there and do that. Uh, there's not enough younger adults, apparently, who have just stepped up to embrace the gift of the Holy Spirit that he clearly would give them. Now, I was very encouraged recently when some of our younger women right here asked me if they could help at this fellowship we're getting ready to have, this next fellowship, asked me if they could help serve, help lead that. Now, think about that just for a little bit. What does that say here in the context of learning about the gifts of the Holy Spirit who knows his church, knows his people, knows what he gifted them with, knows what's needed? What does it say? It means that the Holy Spirit is right here. I mean, what a beautiful attestation to the fact that we're the Lord's church. He's here. You know, many of you volunteer every time we get together for a fellowship meal, all church singing, and all that, you know, cooking, preparing, cleaning. And now, now, the mere fact that we've got some fresh blood willing to join in, that, that's a beautiful manifestation of the Holy Spirit right here in our church family. He knows what we need, he knows when we need it, and he's supplying the need. That's the life of a church. The third emphasis of these three chapters that talk about the gifts of the Spirit the emphasis in this third one is on the unity of the church. So gifts that God truly gives, they will always unite. Always. They will never divide the church. And that's why, like for instance, if we had the time and we turned to 1 Corinthians 12, one of those three chapters, every passage there, it is clear that there was division going on. And, and unity is stressed there because there, there, there was this unbelievably unspiritual emphasis upon certain gifts like speaking in tongues and it was dividing the entire church well moving quickly the fourth emphasis is upon the major purpose what's the major purpose of these gifts of the spirit and it is this to build up the church to equip the church for gospel work to serve and this is where the ephesians text is most, most explicit let's read some of it and he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. And so the church is a very complex organism, like a body. It, it needs a lot of things to grow and be healthy, just like our bodies need all kinds of different foods and exercise to grow strong. It's always kind of a, kind of a sad thing when a church has too many chiefs and not enough Indians, you know, if I can say it like that, uh, because the church is just like our bodies. It, it suffers when it gets too much of anything, too much sugar and starch. What's that lead to? Fat, you know, too much fat. And so the body of Christ has just a variety of, of needs. And so God cares for that body. And, and he sees to it that all the necessary variety of gifts is just distributed among the church. And so I just ask you simply, are you being faithful? Just faithful to serve, faithful to do whatever it is that you know you can do for the good of our church, for the good of your brother or sister here, for the good of the gospel kingdom as we just leave and live our lives for the Lord. Well, let me close. Let me close by circling back to the fruit of the Spirit. But just this quick story. I read recently about a guy whose grandmother lived down in Florida when he was growing up. It's kind of a neat deal. His grandmother planted an orange tree in her front yard just for him. Like, Honey, that's yours. That's yours. You know, can you imagine being a little bitty guy? He's like, that's my tree. You know, and he said he just didn't get to see it nearly enough because his family lived way up north. He said, but every year at Christmas, his grandma would send him literally a bushel of oranges from his tree. He said he was so pumped up. 
And he goes, I realize now she was sending that bushel of oranges to show how nice the weather is down in Florida. Y'all come see me. Why don't we just stay up there with the snow, come to Florida. But he said he took incredible interest in his tree. That's my tree. And so he was always, in, I mean, every year, you know, he would call her, you know, how's my tree doing? How many oranges are on the tree? How many is it producing? And he was so proud in the bumper years when it would give a good crop. He'd get really disappointed when it was producing few or, or there'd be an early freeze and they, you know, the, the produce was stunted and all that kind of stuff. And I just thought about that. And it's like in the very same way, I am convinced that God our Father looks upon us, his children, with very special concern. Just like that little boy was concerned about his tree. I tell you, you are God's son or God's daughter. And he loves to look at you with that very special concern. And he is particularly pleased when we're really fruitful. He loves to see that. So God, God has provided for you everything that you need. Everything. And so I just ask as we close, will you just determine this morning to yield yourself to him more and more as you walk in the Spirit? Will, will you serve here, embrace the gift, use the gift as you go out, use the gift to better the love and the fellowship and the grace that we have here? Will you do that for our good and his glory? Would you please stand to your feet? Heavenly Father, we thank you that we get to address you as our Heavenly Father. Our Heavenly Father. This, this worship service is joint. It's a joint meeting. This, this is why we can't stay at home and just listen to a podcast. We can't just stay at home and put on our favorite music and then listen to some slick preacher preach. You know, this, this is for us, not just me. Now, in your grace, you touch me and you touch us individually, Lord, but but these worship services remind us that we are a family, the family of God. You are our heavenly Father. And thank you for loving us enough to be here with us, to have sent your Spirit who dwells within each of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Holy Spirit who is watching and observing and giving gifts on the fly. And that just means right now, God, maybe you're awakening some of our hearts and minds as to just who we are and what we're doing here. And why I even have these certain gifts, both natural gifts and supernatural gifts. And Lord, finally, just encourage us to go out and just to embrace the cultivation of the fruit of your Holy Spirit. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.